Oh. All right, Brandy, you're good to go. Okay, can you see um, my slide? Okay, super. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Brandy Waite and I'm a, a Genesee County Master Gardener volunteer. Um, I've been a Master Gardener for about eight years and uh, it's a little embarrassing to say, but when I first started growing flowers, I like to grow cut flowers about five years ago. Um, sunflowers were kind of like poo poo to me, like mm, they're too easy. I'm not going to grow those. Um, but last year I decided to give it a try and now I'm totally hooked. And I think everyone should grow sunflowers. And uh, the National Garden Bureau has named 2021 the year of the sunflower. So they're one of the most popular flowers to grow in gardens, and they actually have a fascinating history. So I wanted to go over some quick sunflower facts. Uh, they are native to North and Central America. They are in the plant genus Helianthus. They can be annual, perennial, or tuberous. So the tuberous type would be a Jerusalem artichoke. And there's two basic types that you can grow for. There is oil seed sunflowers and confection sunflowers. So oil seed types are primarily grown for producing oil and for bird seed. And the confection types are the seeds that we eat, that we see at the grocery store. Um, they have typically a black stripe on the hull and you'll see them uh, both in the hull and dehulled. The sunflower heads follow the sun as it moves across the sky, and that is known as heliotropism. And the sunflower head or the disc, the, usually it's black, the center part, is actually made up of hundreds of tiny little florets. And the yellow petals that we typically think of the flower part are actually protective petals that protect those flowers. And it really makes sense when you think about how many seeds a sunflower produces. Each seed comes from one of those little tiny flowers. So there is a close up of those little tiny florets, the little um, black parts here. Uh, these were, are where the pollen, where the little flowers bloom. This is after it's bloomed, so they're, they're black now, but that shows the little florets. Get out of here, a pointer. Okay, so quick history of the sunflower. They were a common crop among American Indian tribes throughout North America, and evidence suggests that the plant was cultivated by American Indians in present day Arizona and New Mexico about 3000 BC. And some archaeologists suggest that the sunflower was actually. Uh, domesticated before corn, which is really interesting. So they were growing it as a food crop. Um, the, this exotic North American plant was taken to Europe by Spanish explorers sometime around 1500. And up until it became widespread throughout Western Europe, where um, about 1770, it was just basically a pretty garden ornamental. They were not growing it as a food crop. And about 1830, they did start manufacturing sunflower oil, but it was actually the Russian Orthodox Church who increased sunflower oil's popularity. In the 1800s, the Russian Orthodox Church banned most oily foods during Lent, but sunflower was not on the banned list. So Peter the Great allowed Russian farmers to uh, develop a crop that produced more oil content and was better suited for modern uh, agriculture. So by the early 19th century, Russian farmers were growing over 2 million acres of sunflowers, which is pretty amazing. In the United States, the first known commercial processing of sunflowers took place in Missouri in 1926. So we were a little behind the game. And then sunflowers as a crop really took off in the United States in the 1970s because the demand from Europe for sunflower oil was so high. In 2008, the US grew over 2 million acres of sunflowers, mainly in the Midwest. So not only are they a garden plant, they're also considered a agricultural crop. 
So the main uses of sunflowers are vegetable oil. That's the number one market for sunflowers in the United States. The second is birdseed. Birdseed is a multi-billion dollar industry. And then confectionery and food use. So again, the sunflower seeds that we see in the store. Cover crop. Sunflowers actually have a really deep tap root, which is really beneficial to um, improving soil structure. And so they have now started to integrate sunflower seeds into a lot of cover crop mixes. Wildlife plantings, um, conservationists have always recommended uh, you know, implementing the planting of sunflowers out in wildlife areas. And of course, garden ornamentals because we can't help ourselves and we just love sunflowers and they come out with new varieties every year. So let's get into how do we grow them? First of all, they're sunflowers, so they need full sun. They need at least six to eight hours of full sun. And you can plant them in a row, you can plant them individually in your landscape garden, in containers, but regardless, they need direct sun. Soil, they're pretty tolerant of the soil that they'll grow in. Um, they'll, they'll pretty much grow anywhere, but they do prefer a well-drained soil. Sandy loam is their preferred soil. And they do like a slightly acidic soil, but again, don't worry about it. They'll grow almost anywhere. Uh, they do like the soil to be warmer. So if you're gonna direct seed, you wanna wait until the soil is about 60 degrees. They do not like to be transplanted. A lot of people do try to start them ahead of times indoors and it can be done. The trick is, is that you cannot keep them in the containers that you started them in for more than two to three weeks. Three weeks is really pushing it. So as soon as they've germinated and they've got a couple, you know, probably two sets of leaves, you got to get them out in the garden right away because they just do not like their roots being disturbed um, when you transplant them. So when you direct seed, that's the easiest method, you would plant the seed about an, e an inch deep and then you should see them germinate in seven to 10 days. So succession planting is a method that allows you to have maximum blooms. You'll have extended blooms throughout the season. And there's a couple different ways that you can do this. Um, so you can, you wanna pay attention to the, the maturity, the days to maturity. So right here is the 60 days to bloom. So the first method is to plant multiple varieties that have different days to maturity. So you would plant one that's 60 days, one that's 90 days, one that's 120 days to maturity. You'd plant them all on the same day or within the same week. So then in theory, as the summer goes on, you would have blooms at different times throughout the summer. The second way to do this is to plant the same variety multiple times throughout the season. So here in Genesee County, we have approximately 19 to 20 weeks of growing season, which is roughly 133 to 140 days. So if you picked a variety like this busy bee that had 60 days to bloom, you would um, calculate from our first frost date, you would count back approximately the 60 days and that's when you would stop planting. So you would start sowing busy bee Memorial Day weekend, and if you wanted to sow it every seven to 14 days, you would sow it up until the first or second week of August, and that would give you blooms all the way potentially to first frost. The third method is a combination of the first two. So you would plant multiple varieties with varying days um, every three to four weeks. I don't know if we really have enough growing time for that one. I would pick either the first or second method. Um, people who grow sunflowers for cut flowers really focus on planting a variety, the same variety that has the same maturity date. They plant them all summer long to get the most blooms from our season. Plant spacing. So this can get a little complicated. It really depends what variety of sunflower you're growing and what you're growing it for. Are you growing it for cut flowers? Are you growing it for a garden ornamental, display garden? Are you growing them for seed? 
So there's two different types of sunflowers. There are branching types and single stem types. We're gonna start with branching varieties. So branching varieties produce multiple stems and blooms per plant. Uh, and they can be quite large. They need more space. However, with branching types, they don't bloom all at once. So you do get more of an extended season, more bloom time with this variety. And you would need to space them 18 inches minimum, but really 24 inches in between is, is sufficient. So 18 to 24 inches between the plants. And then you'd, if you're planting them in a row, you're gonna wanna leave two and a half to three feet in between the rows so you can walk down in, in between. Branching types are the only type of sunflower that you can pinch. So like any other plant that you pinch, it encourages side shoots to grow out stronger and longer and will give you uh, better blooms, especially if you're gonna use the branching types as cut flowers to bring indoors and enjoy. Then you have dwarf varieties. So the dwarf varieties are, I believe they're all branching types. I couldn't really figure out that there was a single stem dwarf variety. So they're branching types that are three feet or less in height. And um, they're really good for, you know, front of the border, maybe middle of the border in a landscape bed, and then um, small gardens, if you don't have a lot of space, and containers. They're really nice in containers. The recommendation for seed spacing is one plant or seed, you would sow one seed in a six inch pot or three seeds in a gallon container. But again, check your seed packet on that. Okay, single stem varieties. So this is where it gets tricky. Single stem varieties, they only produce one flower per plant. Do not pinch single stem varieties. They will not, prob they probably will not flower if you pinch them. And the spacing between the plants is what determines the flower diameter size, especially, so if you're growing for cut flowers, this is probably what you wanna focus on. So for cut flower spacing, for blooms that are four to five inches in diameter, you would plant them six by six inches. If you wanted the blooms to be seven to 10 inches in diameter, you would space them around nine by nine. And you would wanna plant them in a block. And what that means is you would have, uh, say you have a row that you're gonna plant into and your row is 36 inches wide by 20 feet long. You're gonna fill that entire planting row six by six by six by six for your cut flower uh, sunflowers. If you're just growing them to enjoy in the garden or you want them in your vegetable garden, you just wanna grow a row of sunflowers, you would want to, for the taller varieties that are five to eight feet, you would want to plant them eight to 12 inches apart. Um, and then you'd wanna leave some space if you're in the vegetable garden, two to three feet in between the next row. The mammoth types, they grow over eight feet tall, they need more space, especially if you're growing them for competition, like if you're growing them for, you know, tallest sunflower or largest sunflower head, you're going to want to give them uh, some good amount of space, they will need, um, doo -doo -doo. they will need 18 to 24 inches apart with at least three feet in between the rows. So it just depends, you know, what are you growing these sunflowers for? If you're just growing to have some, you know, pretty flowers in your garden, you don't have to focus on the cut flower spacing. Um, you can just go by what is on the seed packet. They will also reach the maximum height. If you're growing for cut flowers, they don't get quite as tall when you space them uh, really close together like that. When in doubt, refer to the seed packet. So this is a photo from one of my favorite books on um, vegetables. Love Flowers by Lisa Mason Ziegler. And this just kind of shows you. So this front row right here, this is a row of sunflowers that she's growing to cut. So they are single stems. They're probably pro cut orange and they're planted probably six by six by six. And then I don't know if this was a rogue um, pro cut orange, but clearly this one is massive. So um, it just shows you how tall they can really get. 
maintenance. Overall, they don't require a lot of maintenance, um, just keeping the weeds, keeping them free of weeds until they can um, shade those out. That's a, that's a pretty big um, project until they get tall enough. Uh, they are pretty drought tolerant. So if you wanna keep them well watered until they're three to four inches tall, um, but then after that, you know, they can kind of do with what mother nature provides unless we are in droughty conditions. They do benefit from about an inch of water per week. And again, if you're growing those mammoth types and you really want them as tall as possible, you're going to want to water them on a regular basis. And the biggest, like I said, the biggest challenge is weed control and maybe wildlife. Fertilizing, they don't really need any fertilized you know, fertilizer, their sunflowers are bred to grow tall and fast. Um, if you do have really poor soil, you might want to um, side dress with a slow release uh, granular fertilizer. And especially if you're going to grow uh, the dwarf types and containers, you would want to add a slow release uh, granular fertilizer when you're planting. Um, just because when you're planting in a container, you're watering all the time. So you're washing those nutrients out. So that'll just give it uh, so some food and nutrition as it grows along. Okay, support. Most sunflower varieties are self-supporting um, unless they get up over eight feet tall or if they're in a really windy, if you have a really windy uh, garden, you might need a little bit of support. So if they're over eight feet tall, you're going to have to give them some sort of um, staking, especially the mammoth ones that grow up to 12 feet. So what you'd want to do is before they hit the four foot mark, you'd want to put in like a bamboo um, stake or a pine stake or a tea stake, some kind of support stake, and put that in at least a foot into the ground and then just loosely tie the stem uh, to the stake to give it the support that it needs. Insects and diseases. I think that sunflowers are relatively pest free. I didn't really notice any in my garden last year and it could just be because they were brand new to my garden. So maybe the pests didn't find them yet. Um, I might've seen a couple grasshoppers on them, but overall I think you're gonna see more pollinators and beneficial in insects than you are uh, harmful ones. The only thing you wanna watch out for is downy mildew. Uh, sunflowers can be susceptible to downy mildew, which will stay in the soil. So if you are going to continuously grow sunflowers every year, I would move them and plant them in a different location. So you're not just continuously planting them in the same spot um, in case you do get downy mildew and it, and it builds up in the soil. That really uh, becomes problematic when the weather is cool and wet. And if you do start to have problems with that, they do make a now um, downy mildew resistant sunflower varieties. So overall, you might see you know, some stink bugs or aphids, you know, maybe some caterpillars, but I think they're generally pest free. Deer and rabbits though are another story. So they love tender young sunflower plants. And this is my little patch of sunflowers that I grew last year. And two of the methods to protect the young plants from deer or sunflowers or deer or rabbits are to use row cover. So I did, I started out with the row cover. It had like the temporary hoops um, that you put up and I would put the fleece you know, over the top at night and pin it down with rocks. And in the morning I would uncover it. And I did that and you know, until I thought that the sunflowers were tall enough. I thought that they were, I think they were like a foot tall and I came out one morning and I just had sticks. So um, I resorted to putting up the two foot garden fence, which did solve the problem. I think also once they get uh, mature enough, they, the leaves and the stems are hairier. Um, so I think you, you just have to, if you know that you're gonna have deer and rabbit issues, you're gonna wanna prepare for that and come up with a plan to protect those young plants. Harvesting. So if you're harvesting for cut flower production, you can actually uh, cut the flowers when the petals start to show color. They don't have to be fully open. They will open after you cut them. 
Um, this gives you maximum base life. It, it happens like though they won't look ready in the morning, you know, you get home from work and they'll be wide open and that's fine too. You can cut them after they're open. They just might not have as long as a base life. So if you do want to bring them inside, look for some in this type of stage where the petals have color, but they're not fully open yet. And then you should get them to last inside for about a week. Harvesting for seeds is a different story and I'm not an expert on this. Um, so this is just off of my research. So in the fall, we all recognize like the nodding sunflower look. Um, we'll drive by people's houses that grow them and you see the heads kind of nod downward. So you're gonna wanna check for signs of seed maturity. So the back of the flower head will turn from green to light yellow brownish about a month after blooming and the, the heads will start to nod downwards. All of those tiny little florets, those will have bloomed and dried up and kind of fallen off the, the center disc of the sunflower and you'll be able to see the tightly packed seeds. So this is the point where you may need to protect the seeds from birds. Um, if, if some of the, the, you know, little florets are still attached here, but the, the head is, is still kind of green. You might need to use netting or cheesecloth to put over that head to kind of um, keep the birds away. So when at least two thirds of the seeds are mature, the outer shell of the seed will be hard. The back of the flower head will be brown and dry, and you're going to want to cut it off um, and leave about uh, 12 to 18 inches of the stem um, as a handle and as to attach to some twine. And you're going to hang it in a warm, dry place that is well ventilated, protected from rodents and insects. They, um, when you hang them up to dry, you may want to put paper bags over the heads to catch any falling seeds, or you can put a cloth, um, you know, underneath to catch those seeds that might fall out. And they need to cure for several weeks uh, before you take the seeds out, out of the heads. Um, so once the seed head is thoroughly dry, you can remove the seeds by rubbing two flower heads together. And you might want to do this um, over the top of a bucket with, um, they say a half inch screen. Um, and when you rub the heads together, I believe the seeds will fall through, but the, um, the chafe will, it'll catch the chafe. So it'll keep it, the seeds cleaner. And then if you're feeding the birds with the seeds, you're done. That's all you have to do is get the seeds out of the head. Um, but if you're going to use them for human consumption, you've got to let the seeds dry a little bit more. So the seeds need to dry for another one to two months, it says, before placing in an airtight container and then storing them in the refrigerator to retain flavor. And there are several methods of roasting sunflower seeds. We just don't have the time to talk about it today, um, but there is a great resource from Michigan State University Extension. And if you just Google it, it'll pop up, but it will be on the resource sheet. It's called Sunflower Seeds Are for the Birds and People. And they go through several recipes that you can use to roast and prepare your own homegrown seeds. I'm going to try it this year. I bought a pack of mammoth sunflower seeds, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> So I figured if we have enough time, we'll go through some varieties because that's the best part is looking at all the different varieties. And I wanted to give you a little bit of information about uh, pollenless varieties. So now there are several pollenless varieties in both branching and single stem uh, types. And they're great if you're growing them uh, for cut flowers because they don't get the pollen all over your tablecloth or on your desk at work. However, do not be deceived. They are not uh, starving the bees. They are still good for pollinators because they produce nectar. And so they will still attract uh, beneficial insects. And if they are planted near 
sunflowers that do produce pollen, they will cross pollinate and produce seed uh, for the birds. So you can also, instead of harvesting the heads and collect and drying all the seeds, you can just leave the sunflowers out in the garden and let the seed heads produce seed and the birds will get them on their own too. Um, they just, they usually get it all before winter. So if you wanted to save your own seed for winter, um, that's what you would be harvesting for. So the year of the sunflower, this uh, is a burpee display at Country Max. So if you're new to uh, growing sunflowers and you just wanna try your hand at a couple of varieties, the big box stores usually all have a burpee display. The only downfall with this is that they are very nondescript on telling you whether it is a branching type or a single stem type. Sometimes you have to do a little detective work in the description on the back of the seed packet to figure out what type of sunflower this is, unless it's you know the mammoth uh, or snack, super snacker, which you know is a single stem that's gonna grow confection seeds. Um, so this entire backside, I don't think I've ever seen a burpee display like this, was all sunflower varieties. Usually it's just like one little section uh, and it was a three-sided display. So if you do want to grow sunflowers or cut flowers, specifically single stem cuts, I would try to order them from a reputable seed dealer, someone in, that you can know that you're going to pick. I'm picking, you know, pro cut orange single stem varieties. Because sometimes with the burpee big box display, you just, you might not know what you're getting. And so I did pick out a few um, just so that we can, you know, enjoy the sunshine today and, and look at some beautiful flowers. The uh, Chianti Hybrid is from the burpee display. It's a wine velvet red flower that reaches four, three to four inches across. It produces multiple branches with purple stems and is stunning in the garden. It's four to five feet tall and pollenless. Uh, the next one is strawberry lemonade mix. That one is from Johnny's Selected Seeds. They say that it produced more flowers and bloomed for longer than any other mix in their trials. It has nice four to five inch blooms in different shades of creamy yellow, lemon, wine, pink, and bicolor. It's a good choice for garden beds, farmscaping, I like that word, and casual bouquets. And it has, it produces a small amount of pollen. Moonwalker is from the Burpee um, collection and it gets up to six to 10 feet tall. So whereas the first ones were only four to five feet, uh, it shows you that the branching types can get quite tall and it'll produce several stalks of pale yellow four to six inch diameter flowers. So that's a nice choice for tall borders and screens. Starburst, uh, green burst DMR. So the DMR sounds for, stands for downy mildew resistant. That's from Johnny Select Seeds. It's an early blooming semi double. That's the other fun part about sunflowers is they come in single, semi double, kind of full double, all different varieties to choose from. These are the single stems that um, I think I was able to pick out. So the uh, Jayamaya hybrid, that one was from the burpee display. It's only 50 days until bloom and it produces picture perfect vase ready flowers with deep golden petals surrounding a pure black center. It's pollen free. It says that it'll get four to five feet tall. But again, if you're gonna grow it for cut flowers, I would space it um, instead of the eight to 12 inches that says on the back of the packet, I would space it six by six and you would get smaller, more usable uh, sunflowers. Pro Cut Orange is a Johnny's Selected Seeds. Pro Cut is a, is a specialty, it's a trademarked uh, bread hybrid variety, you know, specifically for cut flowers, sunflower cut flowers. Um, they have a whole line and then I think there's another one. Um, oh, I can't think of it right now. So they have, you know, that's what most of your growers at farmers markets, they're growing like Pro Cut uh, series. And then Sun, uh, the Burpee Fire Catcher, that one was from the Country Max display. Um, it says it gets four to five feet tall, five inch uh, bi-colored blooms. And I think it's indoors or indoors. I think it's single cut, but it was hard to tell because it didn't say if it was branching. So, but it says that it's good for cut flowers. So I'm thinking it's a single stem. 
These are a couple dwarf varieties. Teddy bear is a super popular one. Um, it, it has multiple branches. So you're gonna get fully double six inch blooms. It's really good for containers. I'm gonna give it a try this year in some containers. And then firecracker is one from Johnny's Selected Seeds. It's a dwarf branching. Um, it has compact plants that produce bright four to six bicolored flowers that are great in containers. And then tall to mammoth citrus. That was one from the uh, big box display. It's a uh, fully double. It'll get five to six feet tall. And then mammoth is the giant flowers that produce edible, hundreds of edible seeds. So that one gets about 12 feet tall. So that's just a very small little tidbit of the varieties that are out there. Um, if you want to uh, try it this year, see what seeds you can get locally. And then if you get really into it, uh, you can send out for some catalogs and um, take your pick. So we can do um, questions. All right, Brandy, um, we had one in the chat box and I think you covered it. Any suggestions to control wildlife when seeding directly in the garden? And you did cover that on your slide pretty well. I also wanted to throw in that woodchucks also love sunflowers because they've eaten mine. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, wildlife is probably, you know, one of the, the hardest parts is just protecting those young plants. Um, question did come in, what are the best varieties for bird seed? If you're so bird birds. seed, you're gonna wanna look for um, the black oil type. So, so not the uh, edible seed type. I mean, I think they will eat Grace, they'll eat gray striped sunflower seeds. Oh yeah, right the cardinals. So the black oil type have a thinner shell that more birds can crack open with their beak. The mammoth type with the gray stripe are more the cardinal and the birds with the heavier beak because it's got a heavier shell. So you can, actually, if you're just looking for black oil, you could probably any of any of bird seeds. Yeah, any of those um, varieties that aren't edible, like just like the like the branching varieties, any of those, they will produce a, a black oil seed. Um, any, okay, sometimes you see these seeds a little cheaper at like Walmart or other box stores. Are they risky to buy? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think if you're just growing them to enjoy in your own, in your own garden, um, you know, I don't, I don't think you have to worry about the investment. I think it, it, you know, if you're growing them as a crop, if you're growing them to produce cut flowers, you're going to want to invest in a variety that, you know, is, is going to work for you so that those are usually more expensive because they usually are trademarked. Um, but I, I, I think, yeah, I think if you're buying seed, even from a big box store, I mean, it's the standard seed companies that have those displays. So those are, they're I mean, all like certified. The then, seed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you just, you, you, you do want to check though, to make sure that they're this year's seed. So you don't want to be buying um, last year's seed. So that might be something that would slip through. Yeah. A um, couple of questions on squirrels. How to keep squirrels from devouring the seeds on the stems and from trashing their sunflowers. <laughs> yeah, um, squirrels are hard. <laughs> squirrels are hard. I would say probably um, if you're trying to collect the seed, put, put that net over, you know, probably as soon as the the blossoms um, fade fade away as soon as the petals are dead. I would maybe put um, like a, like an onion bag or some sort of netting over the head to try to keep the squirrels um, off of that. Yeah, squirrels are hard when. Yeah, regardless. Um, all right, I'm just one. Oh, storage of seeds after harvest. You touched on that a little bit, but maybe you could repeat a little bit. So they didn't. Um, they didn't specify in the 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 research that I did. 
I'm assuming that they were uh, talking about striped striped seed, confection seed. So like the gray striped seed that you you know that you kind of crack open and you get the little the little seed inside. Um, they pretty much all said to let the seeds dry, place them in an airtight container, and to put them in the refrigerator. Um, I think because of the oil content that they can go rancid if you keep them at room temperature. So they said um, you would let the heads hang. So let the heads hang in a, in a dry, uh, well-ventilated area for several weeks, probably a, probably a month. Then you would take the seeds out of the head um, and spread them out and let them dry for another month or so. And then you would put them into, uh, into storage, into an airtight container, into the refrigerator. And they say that it should last several months in the refrigerator. Um, for bird seed, um, I don't think you have to worry about keeping it in the refrigerator. I would keep them in a cool place though. Uh, so that they don't, so that they don't turn. And especially if you were going to collect the the black oil seed for for the birds, I would keep that in a cool a cool location. Yeah, and I know if you're cutting um, the heads, even to have them later for the birds, you really have to let them dry. My neighbor cut some and he put them immediately into a garbage can, and they rotted within like a week. So you do really have to have some place with air circulation and drying to let them dry or hang them somewhere. Um, I think drying is probably the best thing because there's a lot of moisture there. Uh, Brandy, do you know if sunflower honey has a distinct flavor? Have you ever seen sunflower honey? I have not. I, I think that it probably would, um, but I, I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to maybe check in with any beekeepers on the, I, the yeah. call that could let us know. So Rick is saying he starts his sunflowers in peat pots so it minimizes root disrupt disruption when he's transplanting. And yes, that's a good, yeah. good point. Yes, and the, peat, and the peat pots with those, you just have to make sure you bury the entire pot because if you leave any of the pot exposed, it'll dry up and like wick away any moisture. You gotta make sure you bury, bury the whole um, pot. Yeah. Can you plant the seeds from your sunflowers this year into the ground for next year if you save them? Yes. Yes. The they part. might not be the they might not be the same. Like if you were gonna, if you wanted the same variety, you'd want to make sure you buy an heirloom sunflower um, that's open pollinated. So you know most of the most of the ones on the burpee display are are hybrids. So you'll just get a random, you might not get the prettiest sunflower. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If they're hybrids, you won't get you won't get the original. All right. So Chuck has a real squirrel problem. The squirrels chew through his stems and then they take the heads away and eat them on nearby stumps. So the covers won't work. Do we know if um, the slurry of hot pepper on the stem would keep them away? I would try it. <laughs> Yeah, Chuck, I, I don't know what you and the, to Or I would, um, I would see if you could, are they, so are they taking it before all the seeds are developed? Or I would see if maybe try cutting the heads off and letting them dry in, you know, inside somewhere. Um, but it, I mean, they have to, the seeds have to be developed first. I so. suspect the squirrels are just seeing a free meal and um, attacking um, yeah. So squirrel deterrence. Well, maybe we'll do a little research and if we find something, Chuck, we'll add it with our email out to everybody. And um, Marianne, yes, we, we are recording this. We will be um, sending out a link when we, once we've uploaded it to our YouTube channel and um, we'll let everybody know at that point. Brandy, do you want to stop the share so I can share oh, those yes. last couple of housekeeping slides. I was hoping for the birds. Okay, so I'm gonna try to share now. Yeah, Chuck, if you um, if you just let the sunflowers do their thing in the garden, they, they should go to seed and the birds should just, you know, should be able to, to get them right in the, in the garden. But if the squirrels are eating them first, that's a tough one. 
Yeah. So I'm going to, let's see. So I just want to do a little, little housekeeping if this works. It's not popping up for me. Huh. Oh, there we go. Of course, I have everything open, so I can't read it. So I just want to let folks know about our upcoming programs. We do have quite a few. Um, we have actually got a vegetable gardening one on February 19th at noon. Our garden talks are the first Thursday of the month, and we have them right now scheduled through June. So we have some interesting programs coming up. I'll be doing a backyard habitat one on Earth Day. And to register for all of our classes, you can just go to our um, Genesee County website on the events page. They're all listed there and you can register with the links there. Um, and of course it doesn't want me to forward. So let me see. Huh. If you click, click on the screen and then- oh, There we yeah. go. And yeah, I just want to give our Master Gardeners a plug. We do have Master Gardeners in the office Monday through Friday, 10 to noon. You can call them, you can email them. Um, we even have it set up so that you can come in and, and speak to them in a big room where we can social distance. So we're not getting a lot of questions right now. So if you um, have some future questions or maybe you're thinking about something you did last year and you're not sure why it happened, give us a call. And then here's our our website and we're also on Facebook and YouTube. And when I send out the email to everyone who registered, I'll have these links on that email for you so you can find them. And then just our um, standard Cornell um, thing that we have to say. <laughs> so let me stop sharing. And I want to thank Brandy. This is a great presentation. Let me just check the chat and see if we had any other. I know. Thank you, everyone. I had to be really speedy, but I had just so much info that I wanted to share. So yeah, was, this was, it was great. Fun. It was great for a winter day. And, you know, we, we those of us who watched our do-it-yourself garden art, Bonnie's like, yeah, if you do anything, send it to us and we'll post it on Facebook. So if you grow sunflowers this year and you want to Tell us how tall they got. We'd be happy to share um, that information with everyone too. So hopefully we'll see everybody, well, maybe on the 19th for Vegetable Gardening 101. Otherwise, hopefully we'll see you um, in March for Garden Talk. So thanks everyone. I'll stay on for a couple of minutes if anybody does have some questions or wants to unmute and ask a question. But otherwise, uh, thank you, Brandy. This was a great program again. All right, I'm going to stop recording.